for everyone who's here, welcome. I wanna get in the habit of introducing the fellow who's, who's presenting. So today we have Jen Bergeron presenting for us. She's gonna be talking to us about heart failure uh, in peritoneal dialysis patients. Uh, Jen studied uh, biochemistry at Bates College. She then went to Tufts University School of Medicine, and then she did her internal medicine <clears throat> residency at University of Vermont. And she's one of our outstanding first years this year. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Jen. Why, thank you. All right, so um, this, uh, as Dr. Alshami said, is gonna be a talk about the prognostic markers of heart failure in patients who are undergoing PD. And this is, will actually be also a lesson in um, papers that write a really good abstract and you think the paper is going to be awesome. And then as you're preparing your journal club, you realize all the flaws in the paper. And by the end of it, you're not convinced that it's that good of a paper anymore. So um, just for a little bit of an outline. So first, I thought we could talk a little bit about what we know about heart failure in dialysis patients and then what we know about heart failure in peritoneal dialysis specifically. I'm going to try to tackle some of the pathophysiology of heart failure in dialysis patients. And then we'll sort of start talking about what we think are markers of heart failure and how do they hold up in chronic kidney disease patients? Um, how do they hold up in dialysis patients? And then lastly, we'll get to this paper, which we're in for it. Um, so, um, cardiovascular disease is the highest cause of mortality in dialysis patients. Um, and some reports list that it's sort of the second most common cause of hospitalization after infection. 33% of patients who, um, are initiating dialysis have um, CHF at the time that they're started. And this is for uh, hemodialysis. 25% of patients develop heart failure while they're on hemodialysis. So that sort of gives you a scope of uh, the number of people that we're dealing with here. The risk factors for having CHF at baseline before they're even started on an, uh, dialysis are sort of the, what you would think of, um, you know, older age, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, systolic dysfunction. And so the question has been trying to figure out what are the risk factors for developing heart failure while um, you're actually on dialysis. For hemodialysis specifically, these are kind of the like five um, pillars that a lot of the papers reference. And it's sort of tricky because as we know, association's not causation. And are we just picking up on patients who are sick or in general, or are these really specific to developing heart failure? So um, older age is associated with a higher risk of developing CHF on dialysis. And that one's tricky because obviously that's non-modifiable. And then to some extent, hypoalbuminemia is also a little bit non-modifiable. There's been more and more uh, literature about anemia, specifically in the cardiology realm um, and how that plays into development of heart failure. And then systolic dysfunction and hypertension are always signals as well. But again, what do we really uh, do with that information? In terms of the survival of patients uh, with heart failure on dialysis, it's uh, quite a big risk factor for early mortality. So this, every calendar here is a month. Um, each row has 12 months. So the median uh, survival of a, a dialysis patient in one paper was 62 months. Um, and it's cut to 36 months, the green calendars, uh, to patients with CHF. So as you can see from this visual representation, representation you know, there's this significant mortality um, risk once someone develops CHF on dialysis. Moving on to what we know about heart failure and peritoneal dialysis, this is obviously a much smaller pool of data. Um, we do know that cardiovascular disease continues to be the most frequent cause of death in peritoneal dialysis. And we think that it's a, well, we've seen it, that it's a common cause of hospitalization, but it's hard to really um, rank them as well because the data sets are just smaller. Um, as opposed to the uh, 20, 2% of patients who develop heart failure 
while on hemodialysis, about only 20% of patients develop heart failure on peritoneal dialysis. So there is some sort of intrinsic difference between these two modalities and someone's risk of developing heart failure while on dialysis. When looking for trying to figure out the risk factors for um, heart failure while on peritoneal dialysis, it's not as clear cut. A lot of uh, these papers sort of just reference the same five pillars that are talked about in hemodialysis, but there's still a lot of, be, of work to be done to figure out what these risk factors um, truly are. So looking at heart failure patients in peritoneal dialysis, hef pef is the most common phenotype. Um, usually, obviously that means diastolic dysfunction and or um, left ventricular hypertrophy. And these patients are obviously challenging to manage because as we know with hef -PEF, there's like a huge lack of evidence to uh, support a specific drug reg regimen. So this can be quite complicated in figuring out what's the best way to manage these patients. Volume control is also a significant predictor of outcomes. Um, and whether that's coming from poor blood pressure control, left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiac dysfunction, we do know that it is associated with uh, cardiovascular mortality. Um, the trouble is that ultrafiltration failure is a significant cause of peritoneal dialysis failure and subsequent switch to hemodialysis. Um, and sort of finding strategies to help prevent and manage fluid um, in these patients will hopefully help to keep them on PD. So let's try to figure out the pathophysiology of heart failure and peritoneal dialysis patients. It's sort of a quagmire. Um, of course, one way to help us figure out which prognostic markers we should be looking at is to help figure out the pathophysiology, right? Because if you know why the disease is happening, theoretically, we could look at um, steps along those pathways to, uh, to be future markers for predicting um, dialysis failure or mortality or even the development of congestive heart failure. And like I said, unfortunately, this ends up sort of being a confusing road. These are all of the uh, things listed in these papers that could possibly be causing heart failure to develop in dialysis patients. Of course, we know there's the risk of fluid overload. There's a lot of studies about LV diastolic dysfunction and how that can play into arterial stiffness, LVH, um, valvular heart disease, and vice versa. There's also this thing called uremic cardiomyopathy, which I'll talk about in a little bit. There's been studies that have shown medial vascular calcification. There's this nebulous topic of inflammation. Uh, specifically for HD, you start getting into questions about shunting from the AV fistula, repeated myocardial stunning, reperfusion injuries. Then you've got all your normal risk factors for uh, heart failure at baseline that dialysis patients usually have. Then there's acid-base changes in anemia. So as you can see, it's quite the challenge. Um, and in particular, most of these studies or associations are really done in HD uh, patients, and it's uh, difficult to sort of sort out what is specific to peritoneal dialysis. An interesting fact is that usually peritoneal dialysis patients, um, there was a, one study that I read, it was like an eight-year surveillance program, and it showed that PD patients usually have uh, better maintenance of their cardiovascular indices on ultrasound than HD patients do. And there's a question of whether or not that's um, attributable to uh, residual renal function or like the lower uremic toxin generations, or some people are even talking about intestinal microflora. And it's quite difficult to sort of sort out. There was one review that I found sort of useful um, that uh, sort of was, uh, I think it was titled PD patients, where do we stand? Our heart failure in PD patients, where do we stand? Um, and this I thought sort of helped break it down into little categories. So of course there's the general, um, there's risk factors that the general population has, which we know are age, male sex, smoking, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. And then it sort of breaks it down into um, things that are related to just people with end-stage kidney disease, things that are related to peritoneal dialysis and, and, and problems that are related to hemodialysis. 
you can still see that between these two lists, the related to end stage renal disease and related to PD, you've got a lot of um, sort of risk factors that are overlapping, sort of like uh, hypertension, hypervolemia, you know, which one causes which, loss of renal, uh, residual renal function. And it's hard to sort of make headway into what, a, what of this is actually causing the heart failure. Some of the big proposed mechanisms are is left ventricular hypertrophy from chronic volume overload, from chronic pressure overload, and maybe anemia. There's been studies that show that FGF3 may directly contribute to the increase in LV mass seen in these patients. One study um, that I thought was particularly good was looking at diffuse myocardial fibrosis. And they did essentially, they had 40 patients with end stage renal disease um, and 50 with end stage renal disease, not on dialysis. And they did uh, oh, autopsies on them. And they found that the patients on dialysis had a pattern of diffuse fibrosis that's distinctly different from the type of fibrosis that you would see with, a, with MIs or ischemic heart disease. And they found that the patients um, on dialysis had a much higher proportion of hypertrophic myocytes compared to those not on dialysis. And so somehow this sort of pattern of fibrosis and myocyte hypertrophy might be sort of the leading thought at this point. This idea of uremic cardiomyopathy, I think can also sort of roll into that diffuse fibrosis. Um, endothelial cells can get dire direct damage from uremic top toxins, specifically it looks like phosphates, and it sort of induces these pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic mediators. Um, and there's been some studies that show that it's related to clotho and again, um, FGF23. Um, there's also the last the thought was about these PD solutions. You know, uh, some studies say that the PD with getting this glucose load can lead to insulin resistance and more atherogenic lipid profiles. Um, however, on the other hand, when they switched to icodextrin, it showed that that helped um, with improved glycemic control and metabolic control, but it didn't actually show any change in the endpoint of cardiovascular disease or subsequent heart failure. And this is sort of the summary of everything we've talked about is that this is sort of a little bit of a chicken and the egg, which came first, you know, obviously fluid overload is going to be a risk factor for a heart failure and um, chronic fluid overload is associated with poor blood pressure control, LV hypertrophy and cardiac dysfunction, all of which are independent predictors for cardiovascular mortality. And even though we know that water does not equal volume status, the patients who are um, often having heart failure are not compliant with their fluid restriction or dialysis protocols. And so what to make of this quagmire is yet sort of to be determined. So what do people think of when we think about predicting heart failure? What sort of um, markers do we use, for example, when someone comes in the emergency room and we're trying to figure out if we think they have heart failure, if they think they're volume overloaded, what sorts of things do we look at? BNP. Perfect. BNP. It's not a marker, but I mean, the clinical presentation is really important beyond just the markers, like what were their symptoms, how their symptoms develop. Yeah, what are some of those symptoms? Orthopnea, BNP. Mm -hmm. uh, Perfect. All right. And then are there any other tests or things that we do to help figure out someone's in heart failure? Yeah, perfect. Chest x-ray, ultrasound, the echo. Technically, um, most of these, well, a lot of the times the diagnosis of heart failure is sort of a clinical one in terms of using symptoms and signs like Jefferson was talking about. Um, as you can see, this is technically the modified Framingham criteria for the diagnosis of heart failure. There's major and minor criteria. The major, as you could see, it's PND, orthopnea, JVP, 
um, pulmonary edema, weight gain. And then the minor ones are like uh, also edema as well on the legs, hepatomegaly, pleural effusions, things like this. But as you've sort of identified, it's a trouble to sort of diagnose uh, PD patients with heart failure clinically because PD patients in themselves could have a lot of these issues just from this like fluid overload, which may or may not actually be heart failure. Because of this, there, the societies um, have made several recommendations about what to do, uh, how to help diagnose heart failure patients, uh, sorry, PD patients with heart failure. The New York, oh gosh, Heart Association and the ACC and the AHA they recommend mostly going off symptoms, but it's important to incorporate the echo and the serum biomarkers, which is the BNP. The Acute Dialysis uh, Quality Initiative Group actually made a new functional classification where they essentially take the New York Heart Association, um, the four levels, and then say like, are they tired with symptoms before dialysis or are they tired with symptoms after dialysis and sort of help break it up that way. KDGO recommends just getting an echo at the beginning of dialysis and then doing it every three years after that. And the ISPD recommends an echo after PD initiation to look for LVH. Um, and then sort of the follow-up I don't think is specified after that. So this study decided to use the change in body weight, the BNP, and the cardiac cardiothoracic ratio as sort of their markers of heart failure to start with. And the cardiothoracic ratio is um, you probably know, but essentially the, the width of the heart compared to the width of the um, thoracic cavity. So let's get a little bit into BNP because I think that as Mood rightly shouted out first, this is the one that we think about most often. So does anyone know the difference between BNP and NT pro and BNP? That's okay. <laughs> so um, the natriuretic peptides, of course, are counter-regulatory hormones involved in volume homeostasis and cardiovascular remodeling. So pre-pro BNP is synthesized in cardiac myocytes in response to ventricular wall stress and stretch. And it's associated with greater, greater cardiac filling pressures. So essentially after the pre-pro BNP has its signal peptide removed, Pro-BNP is released as either anti-pro-BNP or BNP. Here's a little chart that'll help us keep these straight. <laughs> so BNP is technically the biological act, biologically active hormone and has a much shorter half-life than anti-pro-BNP. Anti-pro-BNP is only a byproduct, it's not active. Um, BNP normal ranges can be anywhere from, well, not normal, BNP ranges anywhere from zero to 5,000 and the clinical cutoff for considering someone to have heart failure is 100, whereas NT pro BNP, the cutoff is 900. We're oftentimes used to seeing uh, NT pro BNPs in the four or 5,000 range. Interestingly, they're cleared very uh, via sort of different mechanisms. BNP um, can be cleared by activating itself on its receptor, being inactivated by neutral endopeptidase or renal clearance, which they think only attributes like six, like one sixth of its overall clearance. Whereas NT -bro -pro BNP um, is purely from renal clearance. So you can sort of guess where we're going with this, that people who don't have renal clearance, the NT -pro BNP levels are gonna be much higher. Neither of these, um, molecules are cleared by HD or PD. And um, it's important just to note that Arnie's, the new class of drugs, um, uh, can artificially elevate your BNP because it doesn't break down, um, blocks the breakdown of BNP. So there have been several studies looking at BNP in the relationship with heart failure in uh, CKD and dialysis patients. This study I thought was the most interesting, maybe one that I should have considered doing for this journal club. Um, and it was in 229 patients in Japan in 2009, and they were excluded if they had a, a cardiovascular event in the last six months. And essentially in this study, they helped to sort of define what uh, 
normal or baseline ranges for patients with CKD and dialysis um, should be, or typically are. So as you can see, um, patients with stage four and stage five CKD typically have BNPs that are over 100, which as I said, that over 100 is uh, typically the cutoff for, uh, uh, for heart failure. And so our stage four and stage five CKD patients are already meeting heart failure sort of, not criteria, uh, but before they are even having any sort of exacerbation of their symptoms. Same thing with the NT pro BNP. Stage four and stage five, their levels are already above the pre-specified 900. So it's important to sort of think about those normal values and realize that of course it's gonna be different in our dialysis patients. They, um, this study unfortunately only did dial uh, hemodialysis and not peritoneal dialysis, um, but you can see here that the uh, both of these categories sort of met the CHF criteria even uh, before they started having symptoms. And I thought that these could be useful numbers to sort of keep in the back of our head when we you know, see our patients in the, eight, in the ED and they have a NT pro BNP of 4,000. Well, that might not actually mean they're volume overloaded. This could just mean that this is where they sort of live. Now, trying to ask that question in peritoneal dialysis patients became not so clear. So this is a table of all the studies that have measured BNP and peritoneal dialysis patients. And interestingly, literally every other one of these says the opposite thing. So this first study showed that there's no correlation with BNP and then like EF. The second one showed the, showed the association. The third one did not, it was not significantly associated and the fourth one did. And so there's a lot of conflicting data about um, whether or not BNP levels correlate to heart failure in peritoneal dialysis patients. I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna have us take a look at one of these papers, which is the, this middle one here. It's the biggest study by far. It's got 230 patients. Um, and it was done, I believe this one was done in Hong Kong. Yeah, so it was 230 PD patients in Hong Kong. Um, they had, of course, a lot of exclusion criteria. So you couldn't have malignancy, you couldn't have liver disease, COPD, lupus, rheumatoid heart disease, congenital heart disease. Um, and they essentially followed them over three years. They did show that BNP is significantly higher um, in patients with cardiovascular congestion, regardless of whether or not they had a LV mass uh, a high LV mass or a low LV mass. And they also showed that BNP was um, significant in uh, cardiac congestion, regardless of the EF. So this paper sort of implied that we could use BNP as a marker of cardiac congestion in peritoneal dialysis patients. They also did this Kaplan-Meier estimates where they sort of divided the NT broke pro BNPs into uh, the four quartiles and had this composite endpoint of all fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events, including cardiovascular congestion. And again, a lower NT pro, pro BNP had uh, higher, had higher um, cardiovascular events, sorry, that's not right, had higher survival, lower uh, mortality, cardiovascular congestion, and um, non-fatal cardiovascular events. So this is sort of the standard at this point as to why we think that we can use uh, BNP in our peritoneal dialysis patients to some extent. So finally getting to this paper. All right. <laughs> so this paper met, was studied uh, 29 patients on peritoneal dialysis. They were all uh, peritoneal dialysis patients from the Nippon uh, Medical School Hospital in Tokyo, Japan, and they only followed them for three months. They did, however, measure quite a few things in these patients. You can see the list here. The three big ones, of course, were the change in weight, the cardiothoracic ratio, the BNP, the pro, and the NT pro BNP. But then they also had all these other measures, including hemoglobin, you know, your classic, your BMP, your albumin, ferritin, all the iron studies, the KT over V, urine volume, creatinine clearance. And then um, 
They also used uh, the New York Heart Association's uh, heart failure classification, BMI, D over P, D over D, um, left ventricular mass index, LVEF, all of these things. This is um, table one. So this is the baseline characteristics of their 29 patients. Um, as you can see, only eight of the 29 were female. And on average, they were about 64 years old, although all, because the study's so small, they has like a huge um, range here. And so that could be anywhere from 50 years old to essentially 80. Other things to note on this table is that most of these patients had been on PD for uh, about a year, although some of them were newer because with this plus or minus, some of them had only been on PD for three months. And then interestingly, for a study being about heart failure patients, the average EF of these 29 patients was 67%. So um, one of the big problems with this study that we'll talk about is that they really did not have enough heart failure patients in this study. Jennifer, uh, I, it's Tom. I put in the chat, what is D over D? What, do you know what that is? I looked it up because I literally thought Dr. Gulper is going to ask me this. So when I looked it up, it was talking about dialysate to D zero glucose ratio. So essentially okay. the ratio Got it. Got of... Got it. Got it, got it. Well, I'm going to tell my fellows because I imagine that they didn't know either. But essentially, it's like the ratio of dialysate glucose at four hours dwell time compared to the dialysate glucose at the zero hour dwell time. Yes, it's a reflection of the absorption of uh, glucose and the dilution of the glucose that remains in the uh, PD fluid. So it's diluted by the aquaporins, but it's also absorbed. So that's what it is. But it should be D sub D zero, D over D sub Z zero. But now, oh, I, yeah. now I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right. So one thing that I had to learn in this paper, and I'm not going to ask people because I find this very confusing, but um, was us trying to figure out the difference between an ANOVA and a logistic regression because this paper ends up using both of them. So the first half of this paper, they have um, essentially they use ANOVA where they all of those um, uh, var uh, independent variables listed at the beginning, they essentially use the ANOVA to see how all of those independent variables could possibly be related to each other. And that does not make a prediction about what the outcome is going to be or like what the dependent variable is. It's essentially just to see how all of these independent variables are related. The second half of the paper uses what's like a logistic regression, which is very much like you have the independent variable and then you look and see if it um, influences the dependent variable. And so this is like the one that you would probably typically think of when you're trying to validate a hypothesis and decide whether or not it's correct. So sort of keep that in mind because here we go. <laughs> So the first uh, part of this paper was showing that BNP um, concentration was positively correlated to, with that of NT pro BNP in the 29 peritoneal dialysis patients. And this is an ANOVA, right? Because they essentially took two independent variables and just sort of saw if they related to each other. I think this is truthfully more of a control for them to sort of make sure that these two things were tracking because we know in general that both of these should increase um, as the heart sort of dilates or stretch as wall stress. The second thing they showed was they sort of took their three independent variables. So the BNP, the cardiothoracic ratio and the change in weight. And they saw if any of these correlated with each other. So they found that this cardiothoracic ratio was positively correlated with BNP and NT pro BNP, but was not, um, but those were not correlated with the change in weight. So as you can see here, no, I don't know. These graphs are sort of bad. But there's technically, technically, these two are significant, right? So the cardiothoracic ratio positively correlated with BNP and NT pro BNP, but it did not work out so well for the change in weight. I'm going to go ahead and sort of jump to the discussion part for this really quick. I think that the reason that these two didn't positively correlate with each other is because one, you have 29 patients, and in their own discussion, they admitted that the weight uh, measurements were a little bit spotty. And of course, some people come in wearing clothes, some people are like still in the like in their wheelchair, and sort of there's a lot of um, concern about whether or not these weights were uh, valid. 
So this, they essentially did uh, the ANOVA with all of those um, parameters that I just discussed on the first page. And they tried to figure out if any of these were significantly associated with the New York heart classifications. They found that BNP and NT BNP were significantly associated with the New York Heart Association classifications. So that sounds good. Except for that, when you look at these numbers, let's take BNP. So someone who has like pretty much no symptoms in the New York Heart Association stage one has a BNP of around 133 in, in peritoneal dialysis patients. But then all of a sudden, if they have a tiny bit of symptoms, it jumps up to 341. And then as their symptoms progress, uh, you know, it goes back down and goes up. So this is, I think, where they get into the trouble with not having enough numbers in this study. And, and they said that the number of patients in the uh, class two heart failure was just, um, it was way higher than the class one, three, or four. So you can see the same trend um, here with the NT pro, pro BNP in that this New York Heart Association class two had a much higher pro BNP than one, three, or four. So although there was a class of it, like they technically were significantly associated with each other, it's sort of questionable about what to do with this information. The ones that most highly, the risk factors that most, or the markers, I should say, that most highly um, were associated with the heart failure associations were this cardiothoracic ratio and actually hemoglobin and hematocrit. And so if you look here, um, people's hemoglobin sort of goes down with increasing heart failure association or heart failure symptoms. And the same thing with the cardiothoracic ratio. Typically, people's hearts get bigger as their symptoms get worse. There was also, um, uh, interestingly, a relationship between the weekly KT over V and the weekly creatinine clearance. You can see that they're significant. But it was interesting because urine volume didn't end up being significant. And then lastly, the ferritin here was clinically significant, or sorry, statistically significant, but TSAT itself wasn't. And so they sort of took that off of their list. Oh, and sorry, here's the, um, the weekly uh, KT over V and the creatinine clearance. So then we move to the second half of the study in which is sort of, this is where we get into the logistic regression. And this is where we say, okay, so do these things um, cause, not cause, can't say that. Are these things significantly associated with developing heart failure? And so of all of those uh, millions of independent variables that were listed on the first page, these were the only four that in the univariate analysis were found to be significantly associated with um, developing heart failure. So having an increased cardiothoracic ratio had an odds ratio for developing congestive heart failure of 1.32. And then as you can see, the hemoglobin and the weekly creatinine clearance um, had their respective odds ratio so that the lower the hemoglobin or the lower the weekly creatinine clearance, the higher odds of developing um, heart failure. Unfortunately, in the multivariate analysis, none of this came out to be significant. <laughs> they then did this um, UDIN indexes, which is essentially to help figure out the cutoff values, to figure out what was the specific number that would indicate a high risk of heart failure. And it found that you needed a cardiothoracic ratio greater than 52%, a hemoglobin less than 9.4, and a creatinine clearance less than 80 or 81. This is sort of interesting because, again, these are just like associations, and it's hard to tell if these mean that this is actually playing into the pathophysiology of developing heart failure on peritoneal dialysis, or are these just patients who are in general more sick. The anemia, I think the big takeaway from this paper is sort of the anemia signal, because this paper went into it sort of talking about BNP and was really convinced, or not convinced, but was really hoping to sort of add to the pile of data that showed that you can use BNP in peritoneal dialysis patients, but it ended up being that strong of a um, correlation, and truthfully, the anemia piece sort of became the more interesting focus point by the end of the study. 
we know that anemia is an independent risk factor for mortality and heart failure patients. And like I was saying, you know, it's sort of the new hot topic in the cardio cardiology world. And then we know that cardiorenal anemia syndrome, like the severity of how anemic they are is a significant predictor of death in peritoneal dialysis patients and have um, shown to have uh, lower hemoglobins have a higher mortality. And then there's the whole question of whether or not this is independent of iron deficiency. Iron deficiency has been shown to be highly prevalent in heart failure, um, probably independent of hemoglobin, but this hasn't been um, studied in peritoneal dialysis specifically. And then the interesting thing was about ferritin being significant in the ANOVA, but um, the other like TSAT wasn't. And so there's a question of, you know, is it truly iron metabolism or since ferritin is actually a marker of inflammatory response, is that truly the um, factor that we're picking up on here? So now that I've very clearly made it um, what I think about this paper. Does anyone want to talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses? I think we already mentioned before, but the sample size uh, not being as much, and also it was like, it's only a three month follow up period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly right. There's a tiny study, single center, only 29 patients. They only followed them up for three months. They were only on dialysis for about 12 months. Any other thoughts? What about the, the, the uh, obvious uh, failure to report the physical exam? Yeah. Right, like after sort of most of the heart failure classifications coming uh, from these societies recommending that this should mostly be a clinical diagnosis and then not mentioning it anywhere in the study is it's disappointing for sure. It'd be great to know how volume over they were on our exam. I was like, you know, just perusing the paper again now just to see if you know, did they say like how frequently they were checking the ejection fraction? Uh, were they getting, you know, x-rays to assess the cardiothoracic ratio? Or yeah, I, I think it was really a spot in time. Like, I think they might have done this all at like the beginning and maybe at the three months mark. This was one of the things that I found so frustrating about this paper is there's like no supplemental information. The method section was literally one paragraph long. And so I had so many questions about what on earth they actually did. Yes, Jennifer, the term you were looking for, I think, is cross-sectional, which is what it was. And I agree with Osama. And, and uh, I, can, uh, I can take off three or four liters easily in a PD patient in a week. Mm. And we do that. And uh, you can you do it with a combination of diuretics and PD. So you're absolutely right that if uh, from one week to the next, it could be quite different. Ejection fractions could easily change taking three or four liters off of somebody. Oh, that's a, that's a really good point. You accidentally just bumped into what I was going to mention next. Thanks, Dr. Goldberg. <laughs> so essentially, um, the, that acute dialysis qualitative initiative was talking about how the New York Heart Association classifications and really our diagnosis of um, heart failure based off echo is, like you said, incredibly dependent on the volume status and, and sort of the efficiency of, or not the efficiency, but the amount of UF that you take off in any given week. And so they sort of made up this new heart failure classification for patients in ESRD. And it's talking about um, uh, whether the symptoms can be can or cannot be relieved by uh, ultrafiltration and sort of uh, classifying patients that way. Um, it was interesting because the cardiology um, recommendations, when you look at the section specifically for dialysis, sort of acknowledges that volume um, plays a big role into the cardiovascular indices on, on echo, but didn't really have any recommendations as to how to mitigate that. I think KD Go was recommending that echo should typically be done after um, heart, uh, sorry, after a treatment, specifically HD. Um, and I think that's something that we need to think about when we're just randomly getting echoes on patients in the hospital, like how long ago 
was their last treatment or have they been more overloaded recently or how are they skipping or missing treatments, things like that. Um, now, I know they talked about, uh, you know, the change in the weight and I saw Tom's comment about like, you know, our patients in the clinic refusing to strip down in the hallway. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I would have, you know, I, I, I would have thought that, you know, if, uh, you know, if you're going to do a study and you're going to measure a patient's weights, you know, you, you could have, you could have said that like, you know, patients can go into the room and then, you know, every patient strips down and wears the patient gown and then goes for the weigh-in as part of the study, like so, something to, to help control for that variable. And if you're not going to control for it, then perhaps documenting the ultrafiltration rate, right, that was achieved for these patients on average during the study period, um, or and also noting what the like, if, were there any changes in the dialysis prescription as mm -hmm. well during? I mean, it's only three months. It's not, you know, like a robust, arduous amount of time to follow for 29 patients. I see Dr. Robari's videos on. That means he's got something. Uh, that was my comment too. I mean, the cardiothoracic ratio is something that I measure at some point. I'm not sure if at baseline or later in three months. So who cares? <laughs> However, a change of weight. I mean, patients on peritoneal dialysis at least would take it seriously here. They are weight. And then the patient that we follow, I mean, we follow with the shared source connectivity, so they weigh themselves daily. So even if they make mistake, we have something in time. So to me, a change of weight, that is of paramount importance. And the fact is that change of weight had no correlation at all with the BMP, that destroyed the argument in my mind, but I tend to be very opinionated. So take it with this grain of salt. I mean, that's 100% how we all practice, right? We all look at the weight and that's what we're using all the time. And so I think I agree with you that the that when that sort of didn't work out in their first uh, <laughs> first part of the results, I was like, oh boy. Right. The hemoglobin, for example, I, I mean, I'm, I never look at that that acutely, but the hemoglobin that is low persistent for a couple of months may modify by itself the cardiothoracic ratio without necessarily that being a sign of are failure as such. The heart just has to pump more. The cardiac, I mean, the volume of the blood increases. So of course you expect a correlation between the cardiothoracic ratio and the hemoglobin. So that I, I really don't see. The other thing is that the patient, one of the factors that found a correlation with congestive heart failure is when the creatinine clearance per week was less than 80 liters per week. Come on. Uh, uh, who has 80 liters per week unless you just began dialysis three months ago and you have a significant amount of residual renal function? The average patient in a regular chronic dialysis clinic will have at the most 60 liters or so. So less creatinine clearance, less than 80 liters per week. Uh, I mean, <laughs> in other words, that is almost the... the uh, my point is that most of our PD patients have much less than uh, less than 80. Yep. No, I agree. I think that these cutoff values really don't tell you pretty much anything. It's just sort of like, yeah, sick patients are sick. Patients who are getting dialysis are sick. And then again, maybe who, we have been lucky in our unit, but I don't see too many problems with congestive heart failure. In mm -hmm. fact, one point that I make to the final fellows all the time is I make a challenge. Please call me in the weekend at nighttime at any time if you are called to see a peritoneal dialysis patient who come with acute shortness of breath, pulmonary congestion. They don't exist. Hemodialysis patient who dialyze on Friday, they overdo it on Saturday, and Saturday evening they are in the emergency room having gained two kilos and they are severely short of breath and congestion. Patient on peritoneal dialysis, they accumulate fluid into the legs and they hardly become short of breath. But again, that is just an observation that has not been clearly, firmly established. Part of that, Dr. Yu, is also probably because, uh, you know, like you said, our patients, you don't have that gap between, you know, Friday and Monday um, until you get to your next dialysis session. And 
when we're when they're programming their cyclers, right? We have like the low volume, euvolemic, hypervolemic settings for the patients as well. So if they start noticing that they're having symptoms, right, then they can switch up to like higher dextrose bags and adjust the settings. I'm not saying that that's uh, fully responsible for you know not seeing as often uh, CHF exacerbations uh, in our patients. But that's, I think that's definitely something that does mitigate some of that risk with HD patients as well. So the, the, the folks on the call uh, are, are very interested in peritoneal dialysis. Uh, I am in communication on a pretty constant basis with uh, Marty Schreiber at DaVita and uh, Denise Chattith at Presenius. And their problems are that the docs aren't paying attention. And what Dr. Urbari and Dr. Alshami have said is that when you're paying attention, examining patients, adjusting the dialysis prescription, uh, fluid intake, sodium intake, diuretic administration, when you're paying attention to that, this is not a common problem. But if you hear from uh, the, the, the general practice in nephrology in the United States uh, from Dr. Uh, uh, Chattath and Dr. Schreiber, volume overload is a big problem. And it is a problem for the most part because the docs aren't paying attention. And we know that from the studies of ultra, quote, ultrafiltration failure. Ultrafiltration failure is rarely a problem with the membrane. 98% of the time, it's a problem with the doctors. So uh, it, that's why these lessons that we're trying to teach you here are critical because uh, ultrafiltration failure as a membrane problem is a very, very rare phenomenon. Mm. Just to clarify, when Dr. Goldberg says it's a problem with the doctors, he means, you know, our prescription, <laughs> our prescription is off. Yeah, we need to adjust it, either, either the frequency of the exchanges or the concentration of the dextrose in the bags. Um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to point out one thing that Dr. Gober said earlier, and you had the slide about New York heart failure classifications. A problem with this study is the whole premise, and like the primary analysis was using these markers to predict heart failure, but they used New York heart, <laughs> you know, failure association as their primary mm -hmm. endpoint. That's not a heart failure diagnosis. That's a tool used after you made a diagnosis of heart failure, like using clinical and other markers. And what is the New York heart? Association just asks how tired are you, how fatigued are you, can you do your ADLs? It really doesn't have anything specific to do with heart failure. So the fact that they conclude, oh, these markers are associated with heart failure, they never actually diagnosed heart <laughs> failure. So I think kind of a big an elephant in the room. No, thanks for making that clarification. That's really a fantastic point. Roger, uh, do you have any comments or questions, concerns? Probably. Well, what I was going to say is that even though I'm sorry that this paper was not as cool as I thought it was going to be, uh, hopefully we all learned a little bit about heart failure and particularly uh, BNP. I thought that sort of looking at those levels was maybe something that I would take away from uh, this, uh, this journal article, despite it not actually being from this journal article. <laughs> Are you going to be checking both BMPs and pro BMPs? No, I think that you, I think what I've heard other people say, and I agree with this, is you sort of just have to pick one and stick with it. And as a lot of us know to do, you know, you check and see what their baseline usually is, and then you see if it's way higher than that. I do think it's interesting to use the NT pro BNP because you know that it's renally cleared. So once the sort of they don't have renal clearance anymore, I think that's a bit more stable of a marker, whereas BNP is still biologically active and can be cleaved by those neuroendopeptidases or whatever. And so I do think it's probably an argument to use NT pro BNP, but that's just a highly uh, uh, physiologic argument, not actually one rooted in data. I think all the data has been pretty equivocal. I think they uh, usually show that they're about the same. Dr. Yu, do you have a preference? No, not really. Right. 
I mean, I, I think at Sinai, for the most part, right, we also just check the BMP. Yeah, that's what I'm used to, so I don't have any. Yeah, that's what I use. Uh, Jaime and Roger, are you guys doing uh, creatinine clearances uh, uh, routinely? Because uh, we work with Fresenius, and they've completely abandoned that. I have to order it special. Are you guys doing it routinely? Hey, Tom, it's Roger. Uh, no, we're not. Uh, the Jaime, uh, yes, routinely every four months, and we use that information, and it's the single most important thing to do because that's predictor of what happens with the serum phosphorus and this and that. And adequate KTV urea of more than 1.7 is not enough. Yes, we do it routinely. I can show I, you. I, I, I so support that. I so support that. I lost that battle with the 2006 Doki. And yes, uh, they made a mistake. Uh, they made a mistake. Yeah. Well, it was. It was the Kidney Foundation wanted to simplify it. And the whole strategy, I mean, was to dummy things down. So let's have one variable, uh, one kinetic variable that we look at it was urea. And, and the one point this paper made, and Jennifer, you made it too, is the value of that creatinine clearance. That, that's where the residual renal function sh shines. Mm -hmm. That's where it stars. And, and the, by not measuring it, we, we lose sight of of its relevancy, uh, that's a tragedy. We should get back to doing it. The problem with it, Tom, is that, you know, trying to achieve, I agree with you totally. And I'm a, you know, I'm not a urea guy anyways, urea, urea connect guy anyway, uh, much bigger fan of other markers and residual renal function and, and, and the like. But the problem is, is that, you know, you find all these patients where they're, you know, their creatinine clearance could be good, but their K2, K2RV doesn't, is not adequate or vice versa. And then, People don't know what to do. And I think that's why they dummied it down. But that's I think right. they threw the baby out with the bathwater. Yep, precisely, precisely. Jen, do you, have, do you have more slides or are we good? No, well, that was that was pretty much my uh, experience with this paper. <laughs> uh, you, Jennifer, I love the way you started this uh, with your comment about the abstract, and I, I just, I just urge everybody to, to make. Could you make the comment again about your choice of the paper relative to the abstract? Because I want everybody to hear it again. <laughs> oh, I was just saying that this was a good lesson in reading the abstract and thinking that it was going to be a great paper, and the more that you read it, the more and more of a disaster it became, and the less I trusted it. <laughs> Okay, I think a lesson learned, and it's so it's so true. It's so true, folks. <laughs>